Yes, Holy Spirit of God, teach us to walk under your authority always because you're the one who have been given to us by the Father and the Son to lead us and guide us into all truth. And may we yield continually to you, sweet spirit. And in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, I bind any spirit that is trying to hinder the session for us in any way, sending them bound to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. I command all our devices and our internet connections to function perfectly in Jesus' name. Write your word upon our hearts, sweet Holy Spirit. May that double-edged sword pierce through the depths of our being, bringing true transformation and renewal of our minds and our conscience that we may continually yield to you and align only with your word. In the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So praise God and welcome once again, dear brothers and sisters, to our webinar this evening on walking under the authority of the Holy Spirit and particularly with lessons, lessons from the life of the, of the incident of the centurion who recognized Jesus like no one else did. In a very amazing way, the Holy Spirit gave me some beautiful insights from the life of the centurion who came to Jesus pleading for his servant, his servant who was very sick, who was paralyzed. Okay, so our key scripture passages from Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 to 11. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, immediately, see Jesus' response, I will come and heal him. No second thought. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say a word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. Okay, this was the scripture which really stood out for me from this passage and this whole teaching came out of this verse, of this part of this verse, okay? And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith, okay? So this is, this is the incident, and then Jesus you know, doesn't seemingly heal the servant and he just, you know, throws the ball back in the in the centurion's court. And he says, if this is what you believe, receive it. You know, it's done for you. It's done already. You know, so so this is this is such a beautiful passage, and there's so much, there's so much that we can learn from this passage. So, you know, I pray that uh, every one of us will truly. Uh, receive in this new year, you know, this grace, this ability to walk under the authority of the Holy Spirit always, always, which is what, which is what this teaching is basically focused on. And, uh, you know, this is, this is our prayer for you, for every one of you. Okay. So an introduction, dear brothers and sisters, you know how often we have read this, this passage, maybe from the gospel of Ma Matthew, like I read today. Or uh, even even from the Gospel of um, Mark, we find this incident, and and it's also in a veiled reference. It's there in the Gospel of Saint John. I don't think it's in Mark. Sorry, it's in the in John's Gospel, but it says a uh, high official, and and I believe it is the same person. Some scripture scholars say it is the same person. Some say it is not. I believe it is. I believe it is because the incident is very similar, and there he's pleading for his son. Here he's pleading for his servant. Okay. So how often have we read about this uh, healing miracle? I've been struck by so many things that actually stand out. You know, there are so many things that you can focus on. So many things you can learn from this passage. Okay. The centurion's humility and his amazing faith. And his amazing faith. 
Okay, he is humble. He is so humble. He knows that he has no right to claim healing from Jesus because he was a Roman. He was not a, an, a, a Jew. So he actually had no right to claim as a Gentile. He had no right to claim anything or even ask for anything. So he was so humble because he was totally aware of his state. Okay, but he had such great faith in Jesus. He had such great faith in Jesus and he also understood authority in a very, very beautiful way because, because he himself knew how authority worked. And that understanding of authority helped him also to put his faith in Jesus. And that's why Jesus commended his faith and he said, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. It's Jesus is not talking about, uh, you know, uh, oh, just faith. He's talking about the quality of the faith. He's talking about the understanding of authority, which helps him to believe, which helped the centurion to believe and to put his trust and faith in Jesus. Okay, so that's why Jesus praised him, praised his faith. Okay. Also, his love for a servant. You know, I mean, servant in some versions, it's servant, some versions is slave. You know, and, and, the, and the Romans were not known to be very kind people in the first place. And especially to their slaves, the slaves were considered even worse than animals. They had no rights, they had no dignity, and they were treated very badly. But this centurion was not like that. Was not like that. He loved his servant. Imagine he loved that slave. He really valued him as a person. And that is why he was willing to go out of his way and go to this Jewish this Jewish rabbi and plead on behalf of a servant, of a servant. That also shows how humble he was. He, he was not the kind of person who thought, okay, I'm the centurion. This is my slave. No, he, I'm very sure he considered people as equals, as equals. So that also, you know, was, was a very beautiful, uh, you know, uh, a, a characteristic or a trait in the life of the centurion. And again, his own awareness of his unworthiness. He knew he had no covenant relationship with this, you know, Jewish race, with this, with this, with this probable Messiah. Okay, obviously he's heard a lot about Jesus, but he knows that he has no right to claim anything from him, to ask anything from him. So even his awareness of his unworthiness shows his humility, of his humility. Okay. And we're also amazed at Jesus' immediate response. Jesus was not looking at them as, okay, Jew, Gentile, you know, pagan, non-pagan. Jesus ministered to everyone. In fact, when he reached out to, in the beginning, he was in Galilee, in Capernaum, which is all predominantly Jewish regions. Then he, his ministry widened and it broadened as he went to the Decapolis. The Decapolis is pagan territory. It's pagan territory. So Jesus, Jesus was very clear. That his mission extended to everyone. Of course, in a very significant way to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which he mentions. But he also reached out to everyone. The Syrophoenician woman, she was also a pagan. So that is Jesus. That is Jesus and his heart. You know, that's God's heart. His heart is to reach out. His heart is, you know, always willing to go the extra mile. And he was willing to go to the centurion's house. We don't know where it was, how far it was. Jesus said, no matter. I will come. I will come and heal him. I will come and heal him at once. That was Jesus's, you know, that's God's heart. That's God's, you know, love and heart, you know, that desire for every one of us. And he reaches out to us with just like Jesus. Jesus manifests the Father's heart. But this time, as I said, you know, the Holy Spirit emphasized something that I've never seen in this passage before, dear brothers and sisters. And this is it. You know, this is what this is what struck me. You know, this, this centurion is telling Jesus why, why he doesn't need to come to his house. Okay, why he doesn't need to come to his house. And he begins by saying, you know, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. You just say the word and my servant will be healed. And then he goes on to explain and he says, he says, I too am a man under authority. Again, it shows his humility. He's not talking about himself as a man who has authority, but he's saying, I'm a man who, who am 
under authority. He knows that there are, you know, officials, there are higher people in the army who are higher than a centurion. A centurion has 100 soldiers under him, but he knows that he's not on the top. He knows that he's under higher officials in the army, in the Roman army. But he, the fact that he uses the word, he says, I too am a man under authority. This, this is so amazing. He's looking at Jesus. Yeah. And he recognizes that Jesus too, like him, was a man under authority. He was, he recognizes that Jesus is doing all his miracles and he has this miraculous healing power and, and everything is, you know, working amazingly through this Jewish rabbi. And he says, this man is special. He must be under God's authority. That's what he's acknowledging. He says, I too am a man under authority like you, Jesus. He's actually saying like you, Jesus. And he was able to recognize that Jesus was working under God's authority. Under God's authority. He did not see Jesus as God. There's no way. None of them. None of them could recognize Jesus as God. But they did. And even the centurion realized that Jesus was special. Was different. He was different. He was not like every other person. He was definitely not like the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the other leaders of the Jews. He And the centurion did not recognize that Jesus was divine. He did acknowledge that Jesus had power, but he also saw Jesus as someone who was working under God's authority. He did see Jesus as very powerful, but he also saw him submitting to a higher authority, to the authority of God. And that is what struck me when I was reading this passage. He recognized Jesus because, because Jesus was not, you know, lording it over everyone. He was not like, you know, bossing around. He was not dominating and suppressing everybody else. Jesus was and always is the perfect example of servant leadership. And that is what the, the, the centurion recognized. The centurion recognized, here is a man who's a true leader, but he is a leader who serves. And he's walking, definitely he's walking. He's special because he's walking under God's authority. Okay, so the objectives of the session are to remind ourselves <clears throat> power and authority come with responsibility. Come with responsibility. Jesus always walked under authority, the authority of the Holy Spirit in absolute humility. Okay? The Holy Spirit and the Word are our ultimate authority. When everything else seems to be dark and hazy, confusing around us, who do we go to for ultimate guidance? Who do we go to to know whether what we're doing is right, what we're thinking is right, what is happening is right or wrong? We go to the Holy Spirit and we abide by the word. We abide in the word. That is the ultimate authority, your brothers and sisters. And finally, submitting to legitimate authority. It is important for us to submit to legitimate authority. But under certain conditions. But that too is conditional. So I'm going to be speaking about that also in this teaching. So power and authority come with responsibility, dear brothers and sisters. We, we you know, in our ministry, we speak so much about the power of Christ. We speak of the power of the Holy Spirit. We know how to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. By praying in tongues, that's what we get. That's what we get. You know, recently uh, I was talking to a, a, a friend and she was saying, you know, I'm trying to, I was trying to tell someone how important it is to pray in tongues. And, and that person is asking, saying, 
Why to pray in tongues? So many years, nobody told us about praying in tongues. Why suddenly you're telling us that we have to pray in tongues? And, you know, and then I was thinking about what she said. And the Holy Spirit told me, he said, you don't pray in tongues. You have no access to God's power. You have no access to God's power. And there's no way you can grow in your faith. If you don't have, if you're not praying in tongues, your, your Christianity will just be routine. It will be bookish. Say, okay, get up in the morning, read this prayer, do this, do that, do that. It will all be doing. It won't be walking like Jesus. It won't have any. Your life will not resemble Jesus in any way. Because you will neither be growing in holiness. You may think you are, but you're not. And nor will you be walking in power. You will not be able to do anything for others. You will not be able to heal the sick, or nor raise the dead, nor cleanse lepers, nor drive out demons, nor set the captives free. This is the mandate given to every one of us. And Jesus did not just say, okay, go do all this. No, he gave us the power. He gave us the power to do it. He gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the one who empowered Jesus, who anointed Jesus, who equipped Jesus. And that same Holy Spirit is given to us in fullness. So we need to remember continually that we have power and authority, but we also have you know, we, we need to use this power and authority with responsibility. This is what we learn from the life of Jesus. Because Jesus never abused his power. He never used his power for his own benefit. He never used his power for his own benefit. Remember what Jesus said in the in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. When the in, in the Gospel of John, he says, uh, you know, when Peter was trying to defend Jesus and you know took his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest slave. Jesus said, put your sword between, you know, in a sheath. Don't you know I can, I have access to legions of angels. I can call them to help me, but not now. I'm not abusing my power. I have to go through this. I have to go through this. And this is why the enemy, the devil continually tried to get Jesus to do this. That's what the temptations were all about. To, to, to convince Jesus, you know, use your power, use your power, satisfy yourself. That's why he refused, you know, he refused to use his power for his own benefit. He refused to turn the stones to bread. Even though he was hungry, even though he was hungry. Why? Because he knew he had the power to do it. He was able to do it, but he was using his power responsibly. And that was not what God had given him power for. And again, neither was he going to use his power for sensationalism. He didn't want to attract crowds. Crowds automatically came to him. But his power was not going to be used for that purpose. For that purpose. It was used to help people. It was used to help people. So that's why when the devil was trying to tempt him, he said, jump from the pinnacle of the temple. What a scene that would be. Angels will come and carry you and protect you. And everyone will be, you know, amazed. But Jesus refused that. Jesus refused to fall for that trap. Because, again, it was an abuse of power. And again, he refused to succumb to temptation, to the temptation of receiving power and authority from the devil. The devil had power until then. The devil had power until then, until Jesus broke him, until Jesus utterly destroyed him. And how did he do that? By resisting temptation, by resisting temptation from the devil. So the devil was like, you know, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them all. You bow down, you worship me. And by refusing to do that, Jesus Continually acknowledge the authority only, the authority of God alone over his life, over his life. So that is how, that is why the Holy Spirit could entrust him with all that power and with all that authority. Because he was fully human, totally dependent on the Holy Spirit, dear brothers and sisters. Jesus did not work when he was here on earth as God. 
as God. He worked as man because he had to he had to pay the price as man, as the perfect man, not as God. He had to shed all his blood as a man, as the Lamb of God. And that is that he did. He did perfectly in obedience to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus always worked with a sense of responsibility and awareness of his mission. And he never tried to, you know, grab attention to himself, giving glory continually to the Father and using his power to help others. Because doing the Father's will was his highest priority and it was his only priority. That is how he could, he could, he could, he could tell us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you because that's what he did. That's what Jesus did. Jesus sought the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things, everything that he needed was continually provided for him. It was continually provided for him. So that's how Jesus lived to do the Father's will and to please only the Father. John chapter 5 verse 19. So Jesus said to them, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own because he was fully human. He was fully human and he did not Work when he was here on earth as God. He says, uh, can, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Only what he sees the Father doing. And with the help of the Holy Spirit. So when he healed the sick, he saw that that's the will of the Father. Sickness is not the will of God. So he healed the sick. When he raised those who died an untimely death, he saw that is God's will. And he raised the dead. Cleansing lepers, reaching out to the head, to the poor, to the needy, forgiving the adulterous woman, and uh, uh, visiting Zacchaeus. All these things. This is what the Father does. This is what the Father does. Today's gospel reading, healing of the paralytic, forgiving his sin and healing the paralytic. This is what the Father wants. This is what the Father wants, our healing, our wholeness. And whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So he's just saying, I'm a mirror of the Father. So whatever I'm doing, I'm not doing because I'm great. I want to be, you know, I want to show what I can do. No, I'm doing it because the Father does these things. And the Holy Spirit is the one who's enabling, enabling Jesus to do it. Okay. So the humility of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters. The second point, Jesus always walked in humility. You, can, you and I can never walk under authority. If we do not walk in humility, the you know, you know the proverb which says, you know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So to avoid falling, to avoid destruction, we need to learn to walk in humility just like Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, everyone, you know, every one of us loves this word. Jesus says, I'm meek and humble of heart. Come to me, all who all ye who labor and are heavily laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me. What do we learn? What are we called to learn from Jesus? We are called to learn meekness and humility from the master. From the master, the one who was who is above all and yet became nothing, became nobody for our sake, for our sake, dear brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus' whole life was an act of humble obedience to the Father's will. Only doing what the Father wanted. That's why in the garden, he, he cried out. He says, Lord, Father, if this cup can be taken away, how good that would be. And yet, not my will, but your will be done. That's humility, dear brothers and sisters, to continually say yes to the Father's will, to continually yield to the Holy Spirit. Today, how do you and I know the will of God? We know the will of God because we have the Holy Spirit in us to show us the will of God, to teach us the will of God, to reveal the will of God, to help us to do the will of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's why praying in tongues is so important because if you don't pray in tongues, we cannot know the will of God because the Holy Spirit is the one who prays the will of God into our lives. So when we pray in tongues, we are agreeing with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is revealing God's will to us so that we can walk in it, so that we can walk in humility, we can walk in obedience to the Father's will. And Jesus' whole life was 
an act of obedience to the Father's will and humble service to humanity. All that he did, his healings, his miracles were not about him. It was to help somebody who was in need. Someone who came to him, begging him, pleading with him, eagerly. Like he tells us, I will come and heal him. That was Jesus' life. Humble service. He washed feet every day. He didn't just wash the feet of his disciples in John chapter 13. His whole life was a washing of feet, of service. His, his whole life was an emptying of himself, all of his divinity, and putting on, clothing himself in humanity, and becoming a slave, and becoming a slave. Being God, he became man. He became man. And then being a man, he became a slave. To brothers and sisters, see the journey that Jesus went through. From where to where Jesus, you know, it, it, we cannot understand it with our mind. We only have to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us how great he, he was and how low he became. That is, that is the evidence of God's love for us, dear brothers and sisters. And he was willing to become nothing, become a nobody and hang naked on a cross like a criminal to prove his love for us, to prove his love for us. And finally, you know, the psalmist says, you know, the, the psalmist quotes, uh, actually Jesus quotes this psalm when he's, when he's on the cross. He says, my, my God, my God, why have you? forsaken me. It begins, Psalm 22 begins like that. And see what he says. He didn't, he didn't just become a slave. He says, finally became a worm. Became a worm. What an expression. What, what, a, what a comparison. From God to become a worm. Do you know where a worm, worm lives? It lives in the dust. It's low. It's despised. It's despicable. See, that's what Jesus became. But I am a worm and not a man. During his passion, during his scourging, <clears throat> during his carrying, the carrying of the cross, during his crucifixion, this is what he became. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. Dear brothers and sisters, a worm is the lowliest of creatures. It's trampled underfoot. It is despised, it is rejected, it's not, you know, in the moment you see a worm, maybe most, most, most of us would just crush it, would crush it. It's defenseless. It cannot say, oh, please don't crush me. That's what Jesus became. That is the extent of his humility. See how low he went. See how low he went. This is what he did for love of us. And this is this is what he wants every one of us to do. To continually walk in humility just the way he did. Yielding to the Holy Spirit. That's what that's what Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8 tells us. Who being in in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. When he came on earth, he was not using his divinity to his own advantage. That's why Jesus did not walk on water because he was God. Jesus did not heal the sick because he was God. He was man, yielded to the Holy Spirit. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and say delivering all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Jesus did not work as God. He emptied himself. He did not use his divinity to his own advantage. To his own advantage. He was setting us an example. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. You know, for God to become man itself is such a you know, an uh, unimaginable situation. 
But he didn't stop there. He didn't just become man. And being found, he found himself as man. And he realized, okay, this is this is this is what the father wants for me. He wants me to become humbler yet. And then what did he do? He humbled himself further by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The worst possible death. The worst kind of situation. That's when he became a worm. He became a worm. Utterly despised, rejected for the sake of his people. For your sake, for my sake. This is Jesus' humility, dear brothers and sisters. And this is what we are called to walk in. And the centurion saw his humility. He recognized Jesus not just as someone having authority, he did not say, oh, Jesus, you are you're so powerful. You're so great. You have authority. He actually recognized Jesus' humility. And he said, and he recognized that Jesus is walking under God's authority. That takes, you know, an amazing opening of his spiritual eyes. He recognized Jesus better than most people who actually walked with him daily. Like his disciples. Who really needed so much more. They needed the Holy Spirit to open their eyes and it happened only after Pentecost. But the centurion, his spiritual eyes were already open. He recognized Jesus better than anyone else. Matthew 8 verse 9, he says, I too am a man under authority. Just like you, Jesus. is actually telling Jesus. And he recognized that Jesus also had authority. And he said, just a man has authority over sickness, over disease. Over death, for death, like I have authority over soldiers, this humble man has authority over sickness, over disease, over 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 death, and that is that is you know that is his greatness, the greatness of the centurion to allow God to open his eyes, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in him, and he saw Jesus. Like nobody else saw him. And as he had authority over soldiers, Jesus had authority over sickness, disease, over the forces of nature. And immediately after Jesus' baptism, Jesus, brothers and sisters, you know, Jesus was continually receiving instructions and directions from the Holy Spirit. For 30 years, he lived like a normal person. He just lived like a normal person. Although he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, his childhood, his infancy, were just normal. That's why there's nothing written about them. Except one incident of the fleeing to Egypt. And then, you know, the, the, the incident when he was 12 years old in the temple. What happened after that? Until he was 30 years old, at that time, the Holy Spirit began to stir, stir up Jesus. And he led him to his baptism. And once he was baptized, the Holy Spirit took charge of Jesus' life. And Jesus surrendered completely, completely. He began to receive directions, guidance from the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 1, verse 12, we read, The Spirit compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. In, in, in another version, it said, Jesus, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. What does that mean? Jesus did not resist. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit said, now go, go to the wilderness. Jesus went. Jesus did not ask, okay, why? Why in the world? I just heard the Father saying, I'm his son. I'm his beloved son. He's well pleased. Why are you sending me to the wilderness of all the places? Send me to the temple. No, no arguing, nothing. Jesus moved as the Spirit led him. From that moment on, the Holy Spirit took charge of Jesus' life and Jesus was continually led by the Spirit. Everything that Jesus did after that was under the guidance and the direction of the Holy Spirit. And this is how the early Christians walked. They walked the same way, led and guided continually by the Holy Spirit. And this is what that's why Jesus' humility was so important. Because only the humble can be led. The proud want to lead. Only the humble can be led. That's why the Holy Spirit wants us 
to be meek and humble so that the Holy Spirit can lead us. So the Holy Spirit and the Word should be the ultimate authority in our lives, dear brothers and sisters. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, while they were worshipping the Lord with fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which to which I have called them. This is how, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, the church continually, this was normal Christianity. This is normal life for them. The Holy Spirit said, do this, they did it. The Holy Spirit said, don't go there, they didn't go there. The Holy Spirit said, uh, well, you know, preach here like this, they preached. The Holy Spirit said, work these miracles, they worked miracles. Whatever they did, they did under the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's why, that's why Peter could tell Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to, to Peter and the apostles, they said, you're not lying to us, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit was working so mightily and they were so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That's why the power of the Holy Spirit was so obvious. And so when they said when they when they did something when when uh, when they did some when the when the apostles did something they did under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when someone when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the whole, to the apostles, they were lying directly to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was taking responsibility completely because they had surrendered and yielded totally. Guidance from the Holy Spirit, dear brothers and sisters, was, was a daily thing was a daily thing. And it should be that way. Only then can we walk like Jesus. Only then the Holy Spirit will keep guiding us and we must humbly keep on obeying the Holy Spirit. This should be norm in our lives. Continually yield to the Holy Spirit, receive guidance. And from our side, keep obeying. Keep on obeying the Holy Spirit. You know, I remember how, how, how can... You and I continually be led by the Holy Spirit, dear brothers and sisters. The key is obedience. When the Holy Spirit says something, just obey. Just obey. By walking in obedience, we can continuously be led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to do, tell you what not to do. If you're not listening... Then what can what can God do? What can God do if we're not listening? If we're not in, in sync with the Spirit? We've not aligned ourselves by praying in tongues. Then we then we say, Oh, I cannot hear the Holy Spirit. How can I obey the Holy Spirit? So start. Start praying in tongues. When you start praying in tongues, pray more in tongues. You'll come in the same wavelength as the Holy Spirit. The moment you ask the Holy Spirit something, the Holy Spirit will say will speak to you. So be sensitive. My sheep hear my voice. If you don't spend time with your shepherd, you will not hear the voice. You will not recognize the voice. And how will you obey? So spend time with the shepherd. Keep praying in tongues. Keep praying in tongues. The Holy Spirit is a shepherd. And the Holy Spirit is the one who leads us and guides us. So we can walk by... When we, when we receive guidance and direction from the Holy Spirit, it should be all the time. We should obey. From our side, it should be obedience. I remember, you know, uh, when, when the Holy Spirit gives you specific instructions, obey, do it, just do it without arguing like I did. I remember the time, you know, when the Holy Spirit, I mean, I started praying a lot in tongues and started, you know, uh, my, my whole life changed. I'm sure most of you know my testimony. And and one one day the Holy Spirit said, I used to I used to be a praise and worship leader. Okay, so one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me one morning, very clearly the Holy Spirit said, Now I want you to stop focusing on leading worship and start focus, focusing on giving teachings. So I want you to start studying the word more so that you can start teaching. So immediately, what did I do? Obeyed. No, I didn't obey. What did I do? I started resisting the Holy Spirit and said, no, Lord, how can it be? 
you gave me this gift of leading worship and and i've been a worship leader for 20 years how can you tell me no no me i do both i do both i'm trying to argue i'm trying to you know uh, trying to convince the holy spirit doesn't work believe me doesn't work the holy spirit became very silent and i would i thought okay i had won the argument okay the holy spirit i convinced the holy spirit no i did not in a little while colin had gone out and he came back home and the first thing he told me when he came into the house, he said, you know, I think you should stop leading worship and focus on giving teachings from now on. The Holy Spirit must have said, okay, this girl is not going to listen to me. I better speak through Colin. And the very same thing, argument that I was arguing with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit very clearly convinced me and I obeyed and I obeyed. And, and, the, and my whole life has taken a completely, you know, is, is on a different uh, trajectory altogether. And it comes with obedience to the Holy Spirit, dear brothers and sisters. You want to start walking in God's will? Start obeying the Holy Spirit. And again, in a, you know, sometimes very specifically the Holy Spirit speaks to you. But very often the Holy Spirit just gives us general instructions from the word of God. General direction, guidance from the word. We need to be able to obey the word. We need to do the word. Suppose we're struggling with forgiveness and, you know, very hurt with somebody or something that someone did. That's what happened to me in the last few days. There was a, uh, there was a difficult time, you know, in the family. And I was struggling with forgiveness. And I was trying to prepare this teaching. I just got stuck. I just got stuck until in my heart I was able to release forgiveness. And reconcile with that person in my heart. And immediately the rest of the teaching flowed. The rest of the teaching just began to flow. I had to forgive. And the Holy Spirit did not specifically come and tell me, go and forgive. I know what I must do. When someone has hurt you, when someone you're upset, when you're angry with someone, no other option. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Forgive. Hatred is equal to murder. Anger is equal to murder. That's what Jesus says. So, you know, no other option but to do the word. That's what we're called to do. In every situation, in any conflict, in any relationship issue, whatever the issue, go to the word. If you don't, if you think, I don't know what to do, see what the word of God says in that situation and do it. And do it. That's, that's the Holy Spirit's voice for you. Until you, you know, learn to uh, hear and recognize the Holy Spirit's voice in specific situations. Even now, dear brothers and sisters, we know the challenging times that the church is facing. You know, it's become a big embarrassment for us. As it is Protestants, you know, uh, you know, they make fun of us as Catholics. They say, oh, you're not scriptural. You don't follow the word of God. And with the issues that have, that have cropped up now, with the, with the direction from, from Vatican about same-sex marriages and blessing them. These are dark times, and it's obvious. These are really, really dark times. So what, what should every one of us do? What should we do? Obedience to the Holy Spirit by submitting only to the Word. Only to the Word. What the Word of God calls sin is sin is sin and it remains sin however many generations come however many thousands of years pass from the time the commandments were given from the time jesus said lust is equal to adultery and from the time we heard that our body is a temple of the holy spirit to be a vessel of honor the word of god can never be outdated we are called to obey always, especially when matters of morals and Christian values, you know, they oppose the ways of the world. They must oppose the ways of the world. We cannot embrace the ways of the world. Then what is, what is going to set us apart? How can we be salt and light if we are like everybody else? How can we be? We have to stand only on the word of God, dear brothers and sisters. And I know, I remember watching a YouTube video 
you know, in the comments, you know, below that, there this one lady, you know, she says, I approached my parish priest and asked what to do. So the parish priest said, pray for the Pope and do the word. Wise man, a wise parish priest. Pray for the Pope and do the word, do what the word of God says. That's our, that's what we are called to do. Going by our conscience is not valid. If our conscience is not correct, if our conscience is not renewed, if our conscience is corrupt, don't say, oh, I'm going by my conscience. Your conscience is not valid. Your conscience is corrupt. You're, you're worldly. You're carnal. So your conscience has to align with the word. Then you can say, I'm going by my conscience because your conscience is renewed and your mind is renewed. If not, you cannot go by your conscience if your conscience contradicts God's word. Yes, the early church is an example of this in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 29. And they had, when, when they had brought them and they, and they set them before the council, the high priest questioned the apostles, okay, saying, we strictly, sorry, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Of course, it was their fault. But they didn't want to take responsibility. The high priest, the Sanhedrin. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So when it comes to issues of morals, values, anything that is opposing God's word, we must obey God and his word rather than men. Rather than men. And we should have the courage to do it in any situation. In every situation, we should be able to do what God tells us to do and stand on his word. Yes, brothers and sisters, you will be persecuted. You will be ridiculed. You will be called outdated. You and I will be called old-fashioned. The world may laugh at us. That's okay. We, will, we are going to have the last laugh. And he who laughs last will laugh best. When we stand on his word, we are going on the truth. And the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. Will not contradict the word. And so if we are aligning with the word, with the, with the spirit and with the word, we cannot go wrong. We cannot go wrong. So we have to submit to legitimate authority. Yes, we must do that. We must submit to legitimate authority. And as a general rule, we are called to submit to the church, to the government, to family structures, to organizations, to hierarchy. We are called to submit. Yes. That is a rule. Romans 13 verse 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So governments, authorities, you know, law, order, everything is there. And it's established by God. So that we can live a peaceful life. Where there is no, where there is no submission to authority, there's lawlessness. There's lots of lawlessness. There's crime because there's no submission to authority. So we as Christians, we are called to be witnesses also by submitting to, to government laws, authority, paying taxes, obeying the rules, traffic rules, whatever they are. Whatever they are. Romans 13 verse 2 says, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, Resist what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment, will incur punishment, another version says. Okay, so we cannot break and flout rules which the government has placed, which the constitution has laid and expect to, you know, uh, get a pat on our back. No, we will face judgment. We will face punishment. See what Jesus tells Pontius Pilate. In John chapter 19 verses 10 and 11. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? What did Jesus say? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. So Jesus is also saying, Pilate's authority was given to him by God. But what did Pilate do? Misused it. Misused it. He just washed his hands off and said, I, I don't want to take responsibility. No, power, authority come with responsibility. You can't just wash your hands off. 
But anyway, Jesus said, those who, who brought me here, those who handed me over to you, they have the greater sin. Pilate's sin was little less. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, theirs was the greater sin, the high priest. Okay? So we are called to submit to legitimate authority because it is placed by God. There is safety in walking under authority, especially under godly authority, dear brothers and sisters. There is safety there. The one who has authority over you has been entrusted with responsibility over you. So we are accountable to them, but they are accountable to God on our behalf. On our behalf. So we are called to submit to authority, but legitimate authority. Therefore, we must submit to godly leaders. We must sub submit as a wife. I must submit to my godly husband. I must submit to spiritual leaders and elders, prayer group leaders. You know, all these structures are in place to protect us, to keep us safe, and to guide us. And to guide us. Maybe mentors, our spiritual directors, they're all in place. But make sure that what they are saying, what they are doing, they are in alignment with the word of God. So if someone is giving you word uh, advice which is contrary to the word, you must, you must confront them with the truth. You must be able to confront them with the truth. And ultimately, whether you confront them or not, do the word. Do the word of God. We may not always be able to confront leaders, people who are in authority. But we know what we are called to do. We are called to obey the word. We are called to only obey the word. Because that's what the Holy Spirit will lead us to do. So in conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, in this new year, I want to encourage every one of you, strengthen your relationship with the Holy Spirit. It must be a priority. Make it a priority to strengthen your relationship with the Holy Spirit. These are difficult times. These are dark days we are living in. And if you are not walking in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you will be walking in darkness. You'll be walking in darkness and confusion and fear and anxiety. So strengthen your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Pray more in tongues. Pray continually in tongues and keep fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Keep on talking to the Holy Spirit. Your mind is for meditation on the word and to keep talking to the Holy Spirit and keep listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks better than you and me. So spend time listening to the Holy Spirit. Learn to recognize the voice of the shepherd. Don't keep saying, I can't, I don't know what, what the Holy Spirit was. I don't know what God was. I don't. That's all, you know, those are all childish things. Put away childish things. Start walking in maturity as a Christian. Grow. Take responsibility for your Christian life. Take responsibility for your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Start walking in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has great and amazing things in store for you. Desire them. Walk in them. Walk in them. So, and again, stay rooted in the word of God and meditate on the word day and night. Meditate on the word day and night. You know, I know many people every year they say, okay, I want to read the Bible from cover to cover, cover to cover. So many people have that as, as their New Year resolutions. You cannot meditate on the Bible cover to cover. The key to growing and being rooted in the word is by meditating on the word. So take a small passage. Take one verse. Sometimes if I can't understand a verse, I will meditate on it for days. Say, Lord, I'm not able to get this. Like today's passage, you know, Jesus says, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or, you know, or uh, rise, pick up your mat and go home. I can't understand that. I couldn't understand it. I read so many commentaries and I kept asking the Holy Spirit, but somehow it did not, you know, I was not satisfied with the answer. I'm going to continue to meditate on it until I get the right answer from the Holy Spirit. I do this. I say, what does it mean? Which is easier to say? Sure, you know, your sins are forgiven or rise, pick up your mat and go home. But I will not I will not rest until I get the Holy Spirit's answer from this for this. 
I read so many commentaries, but it was not satisfactory. That's how, that's how I become, you know, I don't let go. I persevere until, until I hear from the Holy Spirit on this. And I was not like this, dear brothers and sisters. I used to be like everybody else, you know, just so superficial, so superficial my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it, everything changed when I started praying continually in tongues. That's the key. That's the key to the life in the Spirit. And finally, keep on praying for our church leaders. And let's live as witnesses to Christ, be continually led by the Holy Spirit. The world is looking for witnesses. The world is looking for witnesses. It listens to witnesses. It obeys witnesses. Not just teachers. Teachers, preachers, a dime a dozen. But witnesses are those who walk the talk. They preach and they do. And they do what they preach. And they preach what they do. That's our calling in Christ. So dear brothers and sisters, be bold in submitting to the authority of the Holy Spirit and the word. For we are answerable in the end only to God. Only to God. And we will face him alone. We're not going to face him as a huge body of believers. We'll stand before him alone and he's going to ask us, did you obey the Holy Spirit? Did you do my word? Did you do my word? The Holy Spirit is for specific guidance and direction for our lives. And the word is a general roadmap for us on the will of God for our lives, for everyone. And that is what we have to answer God for. So be careful. Be watchful. Be diligent in doing these things, in submitting to the authority of the Holy Spirit. Walk under the authority of the Holy Spirit and obey the word. Obey the word. So even as we conclude, dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> let's thank the Lord for speaking to our hearts in this new year. May we truly, truly, truly walk continually under the authority of the Holy Spirit. To walk under authority, we have to first walk in intimacy. Decide, decide To walk, to pray continually in tongues. If you're praying one hour, pray longer, pray two hours, pray three hours, pray more, pray more. And it's not just about praying in tongues, it is about continual fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So, in your mind, keep talking to the Holy Spirit, keep listening to the Holy Spirit, grow your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit be everything to you. Because that's how the Holy Spirit was to Jesus. And that's how the Holy Spirit wants to be to you and me. Thank you, Lord. Oli namini omne shamni ni oslezi ala loria sleza varna uri sana na kislizi o parlo se kedi andre solini shi sula para shelia slezi mara bash mara la shlazana na kamals lo perazin andre sedi o shnandre sliava. I pray for my brothers and sisters, sweet Holy Spirit of God. In this new year, may every one of them, every one of us, decide to deliberately choose you over everyone else, over everything else, over every other form of prayer, every other form of devotion. May we choose to pray in tongues, yield continually to you, fellowship with you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, and walk in intimacy with you, walk in obedience to your authority over our lives, continually submitting to your authority. Renewing our minds with the truth of the word. Meditating on the word day and night. That's what you want for us. Take control of our lives, sweet Holy Spirit. 
that our life may be a pleasing offering, holy and acceptable unto you. Take over, take over, take over, sweet Holy Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Can I pray, Masara? Last days, y'all, umreko. Om ne ki yar lor ya stesi kliya shlava 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 shle savro ze la fretu zina kaba uria na nandres le ma kanya stresi ola la fre shuni ba eshuni be shara ni ashle zi orvani astebo in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus we pray amen amen amen